Senators, please take your seats. I call this meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. Section two, roll call, Clerk Fry. Right, with 17 members present and 16 absent, that makes simple majority nine and two thirds majority 11. Section three, introductions and reports. Um, item one, a report from the Elections Commission. Advisor Whistler. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Abby Whistler, and I serve as the election, advi er, election commission advisor. Um, our election commissioners were not here tonight, which is why I'm doing this. Um, but I'm here to brief the association on a special election authorized by the runoff rules of the election code. For reference, the commission is governed by Article 9 of the SJ bylaws, the association's elections. Tonight's briefing will include information regarding the approved language of the question, the dates of the special election, the process for appeals. The commission will place two candidates who tied for the final fine arts senator to appear on the ballot. The dates of the special election, the commission will open the ballot on Monday, April 15th at 8 a.m. and will close the ballot on Wednesday, April 17th at 5 p.m. The ballot will be on Shocker Sync, the association's election platform. Only fine art members of the association will receive an email to the university email with instructions on how to access the ballot. There will be a singular question on the ballot. Announcement and appeals. The commission will announce the uncertified results on Wednesday, April 17th at the Senate meeting. Pursuant to the rules governing elections, the commission will submit a certification memo to the president, speaker, and the association's advisor, certifying the results on Friday, April 19th by 11 p.m. pending no appeals. Any appeals may be submitted to the SJA office via email to be heard by the court. Questions regarding elections can be emailed to sja.elections at wichita.edu. Thank you. <laughs> Item two, report from the executive branch, Vice President Martins. Hello. This will probably be the fastest report I've given all sessions, so this is exciting. Um, starting off with President O'Keary, she met with a student advisory council to discuss food for fines, as I mentioned last week. Um, so we're working with parking to go over their operational data, and then we'll be presenting it to SAC next week when she is at KBOR. Um, they'll also be presenting the student fee package that will eventually go up to KBOR at the May meeting. Um, also, everyone is currently working on their transitions, um, whether it be finalized or um, President O'Curry and myself are already doing our transitions, which is really exciting. Our treasurers are also still going through their receipts, and also the appropriations briefings are um, currently happening or are about to happen, um, but all the dates and times can be seen on SGA's Instagram for those who are wanting to know that information. Um, also getting ready to present student fees as well. Uh, the Thanksgiving break resolution is up for its final read tonight, which is really exciting. Director Wynn also helped film our last post for our session, which is super cool, but also like kind of sad, but it's okay. <laughs> um, Wellness Week is also still going on. Uh, currently, the nutrition bingo is happening, so while it's sad that senators cannot be there, we're super happy with the turnout. It's really exciting. Um, so thank you to Director Cudillo and Director Gordon for putting that on. Also with Wellness Week, tabling for STI awareness um, is still happening tomorrow with student health. Uh, they're also going to be promoting their P for Pizza initiative. Um, and also Friday is Self-Care Friday. Uh, minutes and the legislative journal are also being finalized slash started um, because legislative journal is a long process. Um, so uh, I want to just say Nora. Chief of Staff Malone is <laughs> getting that done. Thank you so much. Um, 
Iris and I met with uh, Sheila Surrender over at Financial Aid um, to talk about Hardship Fund and its kind of role with financial aid and within SGA, so um, working on that initiative there. I also met with President Muma, Zach Gearhart, and General Counsel to just talk about some initiatives that we started or haven't really finished and that we want to continue to see grow within Wichita State. Lastly, RSV per the bank, RSVP for the banquet this Friday. I put it all in the group me. Make sure you guys do it. I'll stand for questions. Are there any questions? Seeing none. Thank you. Item three, report from the Speaker of the Senate. Um, I don't really have much to report. Actually, I don't really have anything to report. This is the last Senate meeting that we're taking legislation, so that's exciting. As far as these little ballots here, um, these are for the SGA Banquet Awards. So if there is a name on a section that you want to vote for that wasn't there, just write it on the paper and circle it. Um, but please get those done by the end of the meeting today so that we can get those awards made. But other than that, that's really all for me. Um, item four, report from Senate leadership. Chairperson Thompson? No report. Chairperson Haynes? He's not here, okay. Does anyone have a report? Okay, perfect. This is gonna be like the quickest Senate meeting in the history of Senate meetings. And then um, Advisor Fonseca doesn't have a report either, so we're going to move into Section 4, Public Forum and Presentations. Public Forum provides a chance for individuals to have the privilege of speaking before the Senate. This is a time for the association to listen to what the community has to say, and to that we offer our undivided respect and attention. I would like to remind everyone that although we allow the speakers the privilege to use this platform, the opinions of the speakers do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the association or the university. Item 1, Clayton Stolt and Kevin Saul. for the warm welcome. Good evening, everybody. Clay Stolt, Kevin Saul. We are here to provide an update and a report um, on the past year in WSU athletics with a focus on academic achievement and also student athlete well-being. We try to make a report each year just to keep this body apprised as well as uh, other key stakeholders across the university. We appreciate your time. And we will stay mindful of the fact that we are tracking for the fastest meeting in history. But we do have a few things that we'd like to go over. As uh, we move through the brief presentation, we do want to talk about the academic success of our student athletes. We uh, do want to provide an update to you all in regards to our ongoing work around the recommendations from the Athletics Policy and Culture Task Force that uh, developed a comprehensive report a few years back. Uh, we do want to share some information about the results of our latest assessments of student athlete experiences, and then we want to have a little time at the end for any questions and answers that uh, you all may have. So uh, with that having been said, I'll hand it off to Kevin to start talking about the academic success of our student athletes. So one thing that, that really attracted me to this job two years ago was the high academic success of our student athletes, and I believe if I'm doing the math right, when I walked in, they were at 33 consecutive semesters of a 3.0 GPA or better department-wide. And so as we started to think through what are our goals and objectives, at one point, right, that was a, that was a, like a, a achievable, like, that was a tough goal. Somebody at some point said, hey, we need to be a 3.0 department. And um, when you do it for 16 years, it becomes a minimum standard, right? And so it's like when we came in, what are we going to reach for next? And so you can kind of see that on that diagram there. We worked with our staff and our student athletes and said, okay, what are the goals we want to identify? So we said over the course of five years, 10 semesters, obviously we want to keep being a 3.0 department. We want to be a 3.3, five out of the 10 semesters. And we want to get a 3.4 once. We've never done that before. And I'll share this with you, and hopefully it's a, just a little source of strength, but our academic um, lead, Gretchen Torline, who's been with our department for 32 years now, 
was very, very passionate about that 3.4 and how big of a challenge that was going to be. In fact, she was prepared. She came in with a summary of, man, this is what everybody's going to have to do to get it. And we had a very passionate discussion about setting goals and are you a failure if you don't reach your goals and all those sort of things. At the end of the day, we've had two consecutive semesters of a 3.4 uh, GPA, a 3.406 uh, last spring um, and a 3.45 this past fall. We've had programs like men's basketball this past fall had their highest semester GPA in the history of the men's basketball program at Wichita State. Um, the same held true for softball, and I believe it was uh, women's tennis as well. So I share that with you only as a, a bearer of good news because we have about 260 student athletes and 75 coaches, staffs, and administrators that believe that the academic piece is of great importance to our young people, and it's, it's certainly showing, and there are the ones doing the work. Um, so there's just been some phenomenal work that's been done, and um, very appreciative. It, for those of you that don't know, Dr. Stold is our faculty athletics rep. That's an NCAA-designated position that helps to serve and support our student athletes and their goal, and he's a critical part of that as well. Also want to point out on this slide, we've got a couple of other things about other key academic metrics. Uh, academic progress rate, this is an NCAA measurement, it's an important one. There are a thousand points possible and um, it's an equation and basically you get points every time um, you retain a student athlete and that that student athlete maintains eligibility. The NCAA establishes some minimums. We are above that minimum for each and every one of our sports programs. Overall, our score is a 988. That exceeds the NCAA threshold that helps qualify us for some academic enhancement funds that helps support the uh, academic support services that athletics is able to offer. Also, within the department, uh, graduation success rate of 90% um, last year. Um, that graduation success rate is kind of a customized NCAA measurement that ensures that athletic programs are responsible also for the transfers that come in in terms of getting them to the finish line and to graduation. So really good news to report in terms of um, academic performance of our student athletes. Um, those of you who may have a little more history with this body or uh, in following athletics here at WSU may be aware that um, back in 2021, uh, the university established an athletics policy and culture task force to do a 360 evaluation around our culture in athletics, around our policies, our procedures, key actions to help us move forward to get better. Um, when Kevin and I came last spring and shared our update with you, we were able to share that um, of the 41 recommendations that that task force established, that 37 of those at that point had been substantially completed. We're continuing work on the other four as we come to you tonight. We're at 39 now that have been substantially completed, and we're seeing good progress on the other two, so we think we'll be able to completely fulfill the set of recommendations from that APC task force going forward. One of the big new developments this year um, and one that I know we're both really excited about is that uh, one of the things that we'll begin offering next year is a first-year seminar titled The Shocker Way, and it'll be uh, very focused on um, not only, you know, all first-year seminars, there's general education and su student success components that are common across all first-year seminars, but then there's an area of focus, and in this case, that's going to be the college athletics environment, um, student athlete holistic development, more important than ever right now as there are so many significant changes occurring in the athletics landscape and the needs of our student athletes are evolving so quickly. So looking ahead with this task force and its recommendations, we're certainly committed to seeing it across the finish line. Um, and we're also allowing for some natural adaptation in terms of our strategies and tactics here because the uh, student athlete framework has to evolve to match the athletics um, ecosystem and all of the significant changes that are occurring there. We'll, trans, uh, we'll uh, move on to the next uh, point that we want to talk about, which has to do with feedback regarding our student athlete experiences. We have, um, over the last few years, really developed a comprehensive a quality assurance program in terms of uh, measuring all of the experiences of our student athletes and their development. Four key components of that system 
The first is, is that we get continuous feedback from our student athletes through our real response application that they all have on their mobile devices and they can text uh, observations, questions, concerns, they can send that in anonymously. There are first responders, Kevin is one, usually within two hours they have a response, at least an initial one, for their inquiries. So that's informative. Second, we do program surveys twice a year. We uh, survey all of our student athletes and uh, have a common set of questions that we ask. Those are really important. We'll talk more about those in just a few minutes. Then, we also survey our outgoing student athletes. We do have some student athletes that leave via the transfer portal. A lot of discussion around the transfer portal in college athletics. Whenever a student athlete wants to enter that, we get feedback from them through a written survey, and then I follow up with them to see if they'd be willing to have an exit interview conversation about their experience here. What do we do well? What can we do better? And then the last thing for our other completers, our students that get to the finish line, they graduate, they complete their eligibility, we have an, an exit survey there as well and some follow-up interviews that will be spinning up um, this spring. So those four mechanisms provide really robust, robust set of data to us in terms of evaluating our student athlete experiences. We want to focus kind of as we move into the final portion of the presentation on those program surveys because again, we administer the same survey over time, we can track improvement, and we're able to benchmark our results against peer institutions across the country. I'll let Kevin talk to you about our program survey results. You, you guys are definitely gonna think I'm a nerd on this one, but uh, th these results are really exciting, I think, for me as an administrator, because it's the first time in my 26 year career where we've actually been able to quantify the student athlete's perception of their experience. And uh, that's really interesting because it allows you to make smart decisions in investment of resources in different areas that might be trending downward or might be below a peer group average. Um, and so it's all, we've always relied on qualitative um, data that, that kind of gets you to a theme, and, but now we can actually look and see what we do. So the high level, guys, is we've done these semester-by-semester semester surveys in the fall of 22, the spring of 23, and the fall of 23. So there's been three. What we did is we combined the quantitative components of the first two semesters, and we looked at the change in the, met, the scores uh, as compared to the third semester, just as an indicator of where we headed, what's the trend. And so the beauty of this survey is there's 40 questions that we ask, and they're in probably five different categories. We ask about the institution, we ask about their sport, uh, we ask about their head coaches and qualities of their head coaches and their assistant coaches. There's 40 different questions. Here's the beauty. We have 100 Division I peers. There's 350 Division I institutions, 100 schools, do this exact same survey and questionnaire. So now you can benchmark, right? What's really cool is that 40 of those 100 compete at the highest level of college athletics, which is the Power Five level. So not only can we compare ourselves to 60 um, mid to low major uh, programs, we can compare ourselves to 40 um, high major programs. What I'm really excited to share with you tonight is that of those 40 categories, um, 33 of them scored in this past fall of 23 uh, higher than our peer group average. Okay, so think about that for a minute. That's higher than the 100 Division I institutions, 40 of which are Power Five. And uh, some really, really interesting results. Um, the results will tell you that um, 36 of the 40 items, is a lot, most of the uh, questions are a Likert scale, one to uh, zero to five. And so uh, most of them scored at a, a 4.0 or better. Um, 33 of the 40, as I mentioned, were higher than the national average, and three, of, three more were, uh, were not. They were right at the national average. So then the question comes, right, where are you scoring below the national average? And so there's some three or four things that we're focused in on there, whether that's captains and emerging leaders programs to help with culture and, and, and locker room and transfer portal churn and all those things that happen. Uh, but again, just really excited about this. And as if you dive into the details, what I'm most excited about is that our student athletes' perception of their head coaches and their assistant coaches in all but maybe one category, this comprises maybe 15 to 20 of the questions, are above the national average, which tells you that we have really good people that are leading our young people, um, our students here at Wichita State. So really, really exciting news. 
I'll wrap up this piece just by saying that um, in terms of those few items where either we aren't at that 4.0 level or higher or we are trailing the national average, we are having follow-up conversations. We had a great meeting with our Student Athlete Advisory Committee this spring where we just dove into those topics and asked for a little more feedback in terms of what are your experiences, where can we get better, what are some key steps we need to be looking at. So we are supplementing the survey results in that regard. Also want to highlight uh, two areas of uh, improvement in our scores this year, really excited about those, athletic training uh, and resources for student athlete mental health. Those have been priorities for us and uh, really glad to see that we are seeing progress there. Um, that completes the portion of the presentation we wanted to share. We'll pause and take questions about anything. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you guys so much. Thank you all very much. Okay, moving into item two, Abdel Kareem Jabril. Am I audible? Very good. Good evening. In 1896, Theodore Herzl, founder of Zionism and the spiritual father of the state of Israel, published and wrote his seminal work, The State, or The Jewish State, wherein he espouses the tenets of the ideology of Zionism. Akin to Germany's Lebensraum, and the, before that, manifest destiny of the United States, this ideology seeks to displace a people by force and see the Jewish people take arbitrarily land which is not theirs. This is evidenced by the fact that Herzl did not just consider Palestine as one land, but considered among other locations for the Jewish people, Jewish people Argentina, Cyprus, Uganda, and the Sinai Peninsula, among other locations. Palestine was only chosen once Herzl came into contact with those in the United Kingdom who would be able to give him funds and finance his operation. This is evidenced by the fact that he stated the best method for establishing the state of Israel would be to establish a joint stock company similar to that of the British and Dutch East India companies, which in and of themselves exploited and killed millions of people in India, Southeast Asia, and the broader global south. He describes in his book that the Jewish company is partly modeled on the lines of a great land acquisition company. It is purely colonial task. The Jewish company will be founded as a joint stock company under the protection of England. Similar organizations were the Jewish Colonial Trust, the Colonization Commission, and the Palestine Land Development Company. As I continue my speech, I implore you to ask yourselves, if these people maintain that they are from this land, why do they call their efforts colonizing? He furthermore would correspond with those in London at the turn of the century, starting with Joseph Chamberlain, Secretary of State for the Colonies of the United Kingdom. He wrote a letter asking for his help and finances in this operation, stating that the undertaking will be made great and promising by the grant of colonial rights. He even states in some short years the British Empire would be bigger by a rich colony, not describing Israel as a home for the, for the Jewish people, but as a colony for Western imperialism. He also takes inspiration from Cecil Rhodes, who himself colonized South, a South Africa, naming it Rhodesia, being its governor from 1890 to 1896. He wrote, you are being invited to make history. It is not in your custom line. It does not involve Africa, but a piece of Asia Minor, not Englishmen, but Jews. How do I happen to turn to you since this is an out of the way matter for you? Because it is something colonial. This lineage of colonialism continues past Theodor Herzl and the state of Israel, or the espousals of Zionism in the Jewish state. It's also seen in contemporary figures, 
and historical figures such as David Ben-Gurion, the first and founding prime minister of the state of Israel. He was famously quoted as saying, let us not ignore the truth among ourselves. Politically, we are the aggressors, and they, the Palestinians, defend themselves. The country is theirs because they inhabit it, whereas we want to come here and settle down, and in their view, we want to take away from them their country. Going on to say, if I were an Arab leader, I would never sign an agreement with Israel. It is simple. We have taken their country. This is seen in 1948 during the Nakba, in which 700,000 Palestinians are forcibly displaced from their homes, never to return. In 1967, with the Naksa, in which further land was taken, including the Sinai Peninsula, Golan Heights from Syria, and further land from Jordan and the West Bank. Most of this territory continues to be illegally held by Israel against international law. This is a continuation of genocide that has been seen for decades now. And the only defense that we have seen from those who would like to defend Israel is that we simply cannot call it genocide because the United Nations or the United States have not done so themselves. But we have seen instances during which the United States, United Nations, and other international organizations did not call them genocides at the time. The Rwandan genocide of 94, before that in East Timor in 1975, and the ongoing genocide against the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. These are, are all genocides which the United States and United Nations, United Nations took years to recognize. Simply because your definition of genocide, which you have pulled from some arbitrary law book, states that it has not been met yet, it does not make it so. The UN Special Rapporteur for the Occupied Palestinian Territories, Francesca Albanese, has stated that there is genocide going on. Amnesty International, along with other international human rights organizations, have also stated that genocide is being committed. You have been proven, you have been shown the facts, You've been told the history. The only thing you have left to do is to vote. I will leave you with this, that if the Almighty does exist, and if one day you have to speak to him about what you did this day, ask yourself, what will you want to say to him? Free Palestine. My name is Kinda Balut, and I am here today because imperialism drained the life out of my home, Lebanon. And I stand here because like Palestinians, our families are ripped apart, forced to inhabit every corner of the earth but our own. However, my land, Lebanon, is free now. I can lie in the shade of my family's olive trees in South Lebanon without fearing that a stranger will bulldoze them and build a shopping mall on top of them like Palestinians. For this reason, it is my right to be incessant in my support for Palestine, to come here every week demanding for a ceasefire resolution. It is my right to refuse any amendments that erase mentions of the colonizer Israel. It is my right to be angry as anyone who has looked into the eyes of imperial control and decadence. To see those who you love most in the world devoured into the imperial machine. To hear warplanes buzzing over your village and hearing their bombs annihilate another family. To be told to your face that you make imperialism uncomfortable with your story while children scream over their father's corpse. To rebel in one's heart and in one's actions is righteous. Zionism, Israel, invaded my city, Beirut, Lebanon, in 1982. They massacred my father's village in 1985. They forced my family to flee our home again in 2006. And this year, they have bombed nearly every town where my family resides in Lebanon. I am not unique. However, my country is free from occupation. And one day, Palestine will be too. No Palestinian child will ever know the sound of a missile. No Palestinian mother will cry over her child's mutilated body. And we will make sure of that. 
if you do not pass this resolution as is, you will see us again, free Palestine. Hello guys, my name is Abdel Karim Jibril, and um, Eid Mubarak to those out there who might celebrate it. I'd rather be at home right now celebrating with my family, but of course humanity calls, and so I'm here today to tell you a little bit about my day-to-day -day life as a Palestinian American here in Wichita, Kansas. And I'll just start from just the mornings when I wake up. I wake up in the morning, open my eyes, and I hear my mother watching the news upstairs, Al Jazeera specifically, as it's really only, one of the only news channels that has coverage on the ground in Gaza. I go upstairs and I see my mom just sitting there watching it. And I'm like, Mama, why are you, you're always watching this every single day. You see, you look at the screen, you see a mother looking at the dead body of her child or you see a father carrying the remnants of his child in a bag, screaming, Yeah, Allah, God, what is this? My child in a bag, his mutilated pieces and parts. I'm like, Mama, how do you sit here and watch this every single day? And she's like, These are my people. I was born over there. I have to sit here, I have to watch them. You know, I'd rather be, she tells me, I'd rather be over there than here with my people instead of the country that has yet to push for a ceasefire. And since October 7th, I, my mom consistently watching this, and the rest of my family, my uncles, my father, they sit here just watching the news consistently. Every time I enter the house, I come back from school, you hear the drones, the buzzing of those drones, the screaming of the mothers. And I look at my mother, I look at my father, and it's like their, the life in their eyes is gone. Ever since October 7th, I feel like my mother is just melting away. Her, her, she just sits there. She's, her students are like, why don't you say good morning to us anymore? She's a professor. She's like, why don't you guys? And she's like, you know, life is just hard right now. She doesn't feel like explaining the absolute tragedy that is happening over there. My dad's come up to me and he's like, what can I do? I'm sitting here, I, I feel like I can do nothing. I see these dead people every day. I see the screaming and the death. Oh, me too, I, I look at my phone, I open my phone, and it's feel, I feel like I can't run away from it. You open your phone and that's all you see. You see the pictures of just horrible things, things beyond your imagination. One specific picture that is very much stuck in my mind is, and this is going to get graphic, but you know, it's a graphic thing, it's a graphic subject. And I open my phone one day and I just see a, the body of a man who was ran over by an Israeli tank. It doesn't even look like a human being. You just see guts. What is that? You see on his wrist, too, that he had a wristband. So he was obviously held by the, uh, the IDF at some point. And so they just ran over him with a tank. That is insane. And and for context, I'd, I'd just like to say, I have been to Palestine before. I've experienced the apartheid system over there. I've had guns held up at me just for simply wanting to go from point A to point B, say from the city of Ramallah to the city of Nablus. It's a life-changing experience that nobody ever in the entirety of this earth should ever experience. And I'll just end with this. A quote by Mahmoud Darwish, which is, على هذه الأرض ما يستحق الحياة on this land is a land worth living. And I'll let you guys think about that. And free Palestine.
standing for questions. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Item three, Key and Williams. These are remarks from Kean Williams, president of the Jewish Student Alliance. Since October 7th, I've been reeling in pain due to the conflict in the Middle East. 1,200 of my brothers and sisters gunned down, burned, kidnapped in an anti-Semitic attack of deadly proportions not seen since the Holocaust. After the attacks, I have been subjected to anti-Semitic attacks by friends and strangers alike. I could not walk the streets of D.C. wearing my kippah without being called a genocider. My Star of David necklace draws dirty looks from friends. I have been called a puppet master, bloodthirsty, and slurs for simply being Jewish. The pain I have felt is real and personal, but that pain has not been eased by the ensuing war in Gaza. Let me be clear. I support a ceasefire. I do not like any civilian death, but this resolution does nothing to promote peace, campus unity, or safety, and is full of misconceptions, propaganda, and borderline anti-Semitic lines. While I've had good relations and conversations with most of the sponsors, some sponsors and the author have made vitriolic anti-Semitic comments to me and online. That's why I'm writing today. To start, the resolution cites data as reported by the Hamas-run Health Ministry. There are many inconsistencies in data and switches and reporting systems that undermine the accuracy of this resolution as well as its intent. It also cites damage to the healthcare and education sector sectors in an attempt to demonize Israel instead of recognizing Hamas's use of civilian infrastructure from which it can plan, stage, and launch its attacks. Further, the resolution calls for an end to arms deal to Israel. Instead of advocating for condition on sales, they call for complete and total disarmament of the world's only Jewish state. After decades of constant attacks, after the deadliest day for Jews since the Holocaust, the author would like the Jewish people to throw away all of their defenses and accept their fate, to be killed for the crime of being Jewish. Lastly, the resolution implies that what is incurring in the region is a genocide, and they are partially correct. There was a genocide, and it was carried out on October 7th by the Hamas. The targeting of civilians because of their nationality and Jewish ethnicity is by definition genocide. The, came, the same cannot be said for Israel, who neither targets civilians or kills on the basis of ethnicity. The double standards being applied on the Jews and Israelis that they must accept the killing of their people and cannot defend themselves is absurd. I want to support this resolution, and I stand with our fellow RSOs in advocating for peace in our shared region, but I cannot, in good faith, support a resolution that goes beyond peace and implicitly advocates for more destruction. And that is why I'm happily, happy to support the amendments being proposed by Senator Bobbitt, which finds principled middle ground that focuses on peace and supporting our hurting communities. No resolution on this topic will be perfect, but Senator Bobbitt's amendments provide the clearest path to unity in supporting all of our students while saying no to anti-Semitic lies. We hope you will support these amendments, and if passed, will vote in favor of this resolution. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public forum at this time? The floor is yours. Hi, my name is Janice Bradley, and I uh, graduated here in 92 and got my master's in 93. So I just want to, I'm not sure about this resolution. Do you all have a copy of this? Is, is that what you were referring to? Okay. So I have not seen the document, but... I would just mainly say that I think the importance of a resolution in this case is to call for a ceasefire and for the opening up and the delivery, the actual delivery of humanitarian aid to Gaza. Yesterday, there were 468 trucks that entered. That's about... Uh, 34 less than uh, used to come through every day, 500 trucks a day. 
and there have been, uh, there's famine going on there. So I don't know what you have in front of you, you know, you can uh, edit, uh, amend, uh, but I would ask that you focus on the primary and most important things, and that is bringing peace to the region through a, a ceasefire. You know, the United States abstained on the ceasefire resolution in the United Nations that actually passed finally after many attempts. And then they turned around and said this was not binding. Security Council resolutions in the United Nations are binding. So don't, don't let them fool you here. That's not how it goes. Israel has been, it was determined in the International Court of Justice that Israel is plausibly committing genocide. Yes, it takes a long time for that definition to, to be established. But it was enough, you know, and you, you, you don't even have to mention these, all these issues in the resolution, but I would ask that you simply uh, focus on the ceasefire aspect and the delivery of aid, which has been hijacked by the Israelis. You know, in this incident with World Central Kitchen, what it took, the killing of six white European uh, aid workers to get everybody's goat up? There's been more than 200 aid workers in Palestine killed through this war on Gaza. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public forum at this time? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna move on and I'm going to call a quick five minute recess.
Hi, if any of you would like to see the resolution when it's sent in an email to you, please raise your hand and Chairperson Owens will come to you and we can send it to you. Hey folks, hey everybody. I'm sharing the resolution with people who want it. Anyone else, please raise your hand. I will come to you. Last call. Beautiful stuff. Okay, thank you. Senators, please take your seats. I call this meeting back into order at 7.29 p.m. Before we get started, I am going to move item 6.3, act on request to approve AR-66-008 Thanksgiving break to 6.2 so that we can devote the rest of the meeting time to the ceasefire in Gaza resolution. Moving into section five, approval of the consent agenda. Are there any objections to the consent agenda? Okay. Seeing none, the consent agenda is approved as such. Moving into section six, consideration of pending business. Item one, act on request to approve SB-66-239, Sabbatical Creation Act. Does the author here wish to speak? The floor is yours. Hello everyone, I'll make this quick to make space for other issues. Um, we know what this legislation is about, basically creating sabbaticals for all three branches so that everyone who has or needs access to a break gets one. That's all. Okay. We are going to move into the debate period. Is there anyone who would like to speak in debate? Chair, Chairperson Owens. Hello. Um, 
I move to amend section three, section one, wait, sorry, okay. This is gonna be a little difficult. I'll bring my laptop up there later. It's gonna be section three, apl applicable policies, part one, membership policies, sub point B, strike that section and instead amend it to include Officials on sabbatical shall still count towards senatorial quorum period and then create a sub subsection utilizing procedural or voting privileges while on sabbatical shall be considered a notification that they have concluded their sabbatical early period. Is there a second? Okay. Would you like to speak on this amendment? For context, we probably talked about this yes, last time as um, other people had been questioning parts of this bill, specifically relinquishing procedural and voting rights for those on sabbatical, which we did find was unconstitutional based on what the judicial branch had said. I'm just amending this to make sure that they do have access to their procedural or voting rights, but if they do use those voting rights or procedural rights, then their sabbatical will be concluded early. Um, this is not to take away any rights from those on sabbatical, but to ensure that those who do have access to this chamber meet quorum, have access to the room, and make sure that big votes don't end up being impeded due to the fact that these people are on sabbatical. That's all. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this amendment? Okay, seeing none, we're going to move into the voting period on the amendment. Turn on your clickers, press AA to sign in, and then A is yes, B is no, C is abstain. The voting window is open. With 18 yes, zero no, and zero abstentions, the amendment passes. Now we are going to move back into the debate period on the legislation itself. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in debate? Chairperson Owens. I'll make this very quick. Um, this is something that not only needs to happen, but has to happen. Accessibility on this campus must be fixed. And if we don't start with the SGA, the legislative body of this campus, then where are we starting? And so this is only the beginning of not only what's going to um, help push us for a better um, body to legislate for every student here on campus, but also make sure that everyone here on campus who is legislating has the ability to do so to the best of their ability. That's all. Okay. Is there Chairperson sure, Owens? I'm losing my voice, so bear with me. Um, but if you were here uh, a while ago, and this isn't your first year, um, it, we've lost quite a few people. A lot of people who I believe through this bill um, and resolution could have been prevented by providing a space that is not only accessible, but also ensures that the, the people are being taken care of and that we are ensuring um, you know, that community feel is so important um, to give a moment to chairperson uh, a. Owens, um, who, you know, had to step down from a previous position due to, you know, uh, complications and that could have been prevented through this type of resolution. Um, sorry, again, still losing my voice. Um, but I think this is a fantastic step, especially in a space that will no longer uh, be occupied by an accessibility subcommittee chair. Um, it is more powerful than ever to say that we, although we have absolved that chair uh, subcommittee, that we still hold up um, you know, those principles and that we're still maintaining an accessible space. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak in debate? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna move into the voting period. The voting window is open. With 19 yes, zero no, and zero abstentions, the motion passes. Okay, moving into 6.2, act on request to approve AR-66-008, Thanksgiving break. Would you like to speak? I moved it. Is it still 6.3? It doesn't matter, it's okay. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Um, so basically, this is the resolution for the Thanksgiving break. Um, we talked about it last week, and we just want to 
go hand in hand with our sister institutions, K-State and KU, for a Thanksgiving break that is one week long. Um, yeah, I will stand for questions. Chairperson Thompson. So I asked last week if there was any information from the sister institutions about satisfaction with the changes. Yes, so I actually met with the SAC today and I did ask KU and K-State that, and they said that their students actually pretty much enjoy it for the simple fact that they do have a lot of um, out-of-staters, and so they have the ability to go home if they need to and have the entire week to not think about classes. Chairperson Owens. I may be misinterpreting this, but would this indicate or change um, fall break to not happen anymore? Yes, so it would reallocate those days, those two days that we get for fall break, and make it a full week for Thanksgiving break. Are there any other questions? Oh, Chairperson Owens. Hi. I wasn't here last week. Um, that was gone. Um, but I, I would love to ask, um, you know, feedback from um, the university in implementing this and uh, potential progress after this is, you know, across our fingers passed um, of how likely this is. So next steps, if this were to pass, is well, Sophie and I will be having conversations with faculty senate president. And as far as the university, we ha we they are on board. Um, it's not that big of an ask to re reallocate uh, break days, anyways. They just have to do it from a, the president would take it and it would go to a KBOR level, and then he would just request it that way, and then they would pass it through or decline it, which I'm pretty sure that they would for the simple fact another two other schools do it that way are there any other questions okay seeing none thank you we're going to move into the debate period <laughs> is there anyone who'd like to speak in debate chairperson Ahrens I'm going to have to speak in negation of this bill um, I believe that the fall break is something that a lot of students appreciate and utilize as it is a good mid-semester break that allows students to go home, recharge, and especially as an out-of-state student, I think that that's a time that is really helpful for students that may live further away from their families to be able to go home and see their families. Um, it's a longer period of time. so especially for those that may need to travel further, it makes it more worth it for them to do that travel since it's not just like a weekend or something like that. Um, and I think especially, um, I'm the fine arts senator, I think that for fine arts students, we have a lot of work that happens throughout the semester. And so that little break is really nice to be able to catch up on projects and also just have a moment to not have to worry about classes. And so I am in favor of keeping fall break as it is. Chairperson Thompson. I'm going to have to speak in negation as well. Um, alluding to the same point, in September we have a three-day weekend, in October we have a four-day weekend, and in November we have a five-day weekend. And so it, during COVID, we you know experimented with not having three- and four-day weekends in the early parts of the semester. And the reason why I asked for feedback was because the common feedback during that period was that students were getting very burnt out not having those small breaks that actually have a lot of impact. Um, and while it could be argued that Thanksgiving break being nine days could you know, increase the amount of work that's done over Thanksgiving break, I personally probably wouldn't work any more than I already do. Um, so I'm going to have to speak in negation. I'm sorry. Is there anyone else who'd like? Um, Senator Walter. I'm going to, oh, it is on. I'm going to speak in affirmation for the reasoning of, I do like fall break, but as a out of state student, for me, I didn't get to, I don't get to go home for fall break for just the weekend. It's too far for me to personally travel. Same with Thanksgiving this past year. I didn't get to go home, but I also have family here. So I'm going to speak in affirmation because I do kind of want to go home for Thanksgiving break. So if it's longer, I would be more likely to convince my family to let me come home and having that um, longer break, I feel like would be nice for me for like Thanksgiving and other out-of-state students. 
Chairperson Owens. I really appreciate um, the forethought in changing this. Um, I'm choosing to abstain uh, simply because I would appreciate more input from students, especially with divisiveness in this chamber. I, I presume divisiveness would also resound within our community, our WCU community as well, and students. So I would appreciate maybe a survey being done before we, you know, change something this drastically or um, Anything to get more feedback from students would be appreciated. If that's already been done, fantastic. I'd love to see the numbers. I can, you know, uh, change from there uh, about my point of view, but, you know, I'm obviously seeing different point of views, and that's super normal, appreciated, love that. Um, but, you know, I could go either way with this, so. Senator Lewis. Is, oh, Senator Brown. Hi, I am going to speak um, in the negation of this bill also. Um, I think just talking from to students, um, you know, like the Owen said, um, I would just like to see a survey. Um, students will also like to see a survey. Um, that was something that they spoke on that they did not see. Um, and a lot of students enjoy fall break um, because it gives us a time to like self-reflect with mental health and things like that because a lot of students are burnt out um, throughout the semester. So just looking towards that fall break um, is really cool. So, yeah. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak in debate? Seeing none, we're going to move into the voting period. The voting window is open. With six yes, eight no, and five abstentions, the motion fails. Moving back into um, item three, act on request to approve AR-66-007, ceasefire in Gaza. Is the author here wish to speak? The floor is yours. Sure, is it okay if I speak from my seat? All right. So um, I would like to first start out by renouncing the accusations of anti-Semitism. Uh, first, none of my co-sponsors have ever spoken with the individual making said accusations ever. I myself have never made or made any anti-Semitic uh, remarks. Excuse me, I'm extremely nervous right now. Um, the accusations of anti-Semitism uh, towards me started a long time ago after I cut contact with the individual making the accusations due to uh, some very... Um, uh, uncomfortable behavior that they displayed against me, and I simply could not put up with it anymore. Um, and part of why I had the strength to cut contact with the individual is because although I may have put up with um, these actions, um, otherwise I simply could not take it from somebody who had n absolutely no empathy for people living in the Middle East and experiencing um, crimes against humanity beyond my comprehension. Um, so further, um, my resolution, um, if any uh, aspect of it is anti-Semitic and anybody in this room uh, agrees with it, I would be happy to amend those parts because I would absolutely not like to have anything um, on campus that would make uh, Jewish people feel uncomfortable or, um, uh, you know, commit any... Um, uh, aggressions against a minority group. Wichita State is not a place that anybody should feel uncomfortable or unsafe on, and that, is, um, that goes for uh, Jewish students, and that also goes for Arab and Muslim students. Um, so I think that the resolution is important because um, as a public institution, we have a duty, and as students, we have a duty. Students have historically stood up for um, what is ethically right and against war. Um, some examples of this are students who protested against the Vietnam War and gained rights for students um, nationally to speak out in, on their campuses and schools. Um, I also believe that in a um, current time that um, refuses to acknowledge um, human rights violations, it is important that large groups of people, like student government, um, put
push our public institution to um, urge for a ceasefire and um, ending of these human rights abuses. Um, that is all I have to say. Thank you. We are going to move into the debate period. Is there anyone who'd like to speak in debate on this resolution? Chairperson Owens. I would like to motion to move to the Committee of the Whole. Are there any objections? Seeing none, the motion passes. I'd also recommend that someone explain what Committee of the Whole is for those in the gallery, as well as what is and isn't allowed during that time. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yes, Committee of the Whole is a moment for the Senate um, to, it is our least formal way uh, to process and discuss legislation. Um, it is still an open process or open meeting or open period of the meeting, um, but it is only for members of the Senate to engage in. And so I would encourage uh, members in the audience, one, to be respectful of that, and two, as they're discussing things in Committee of the Whole, um, none of the votes that are taken in the Committee Whole are binding votes. All of them are just to test the kind of water or thoughts of members of the Senate uh, without processing formal votes. Um, there's not uh, uh, the formal uh, Roberts rules in process of um, you can still you call people by the first names if you want, whatever you want from there. Uh, but none of the votes taken in Committee of the Whole are binding votes. All of those will have to be taken in the full Senate. Um, you can't make amendments on, on bills. Um, in Committee of the Whole because of, of the way that we, we process Committee of the Whole here. Um, so really it, it is a moment for just the members of the Senate um, and, uh, and leadership to engage in, in conversations and discussions about particular things um, and not necessarily a time for um, binding debates and binding votes. All those things will have to happen back in formal meeting when we um, adjourn Committee of the Whole into full session. I'm happy to answer questions if there are questions or clarifications that members have. Wonderful. Does that answer your question, hey, Victoria? Oh, Adriana, sorry. One, two, I thought I had it. Wrong, I went. Does that answer your question, Adriana? Wonderful. Would anyone like to speak on this legislation? Chairperson Owens. I would just like to start um, by saying that I think committee of the whole is important because we see a lot of divisiveness not only in this chamber but on this campus. I would also like to say that um, I love this legislation. I think it's not only necessary, but um, needs to happen. I think um, though we are a small university, we have a large impact on the voices and on what other universities in Kansas will do in turn. Also addressing what's happening in the world is not only important, but necessary. We have a lot of poli-sci majors in this room, which will then in turn become members of the world who will address and talk about important policies that will affect everyone. So we have to start here. This is important work. And I thought Committee of the Whole would be not only necessary because we can't just blaze this along, we must talk about it. And we must also understand that cooperation is necessary and that not everyone is going to get what they necessarily need from this resolution, but we must make sure that people are comfortable passing it and that their voices were heard. Even if people didn't necessarily get all the language that they wanted or all the amendments that they potentially wanted, we need to make sure that everyone feels as if they had what they said and they said what they needed to say about the, the resolution because a lot of important people and a, and a lot of people are affected by this. And so I'm just going to open that to the floor. If people have potential amendments, we can talk about that. Um, Senator Peng. I totally agree with her. Um, this resolution is definitely needed for, we speak for the students, but I would like to make some amendments when we do go back into full Senate on a on every line of be it further resolved that Wichita State dot dot dot. While we only speak for the students, we do not speak for the whole university. We do not need some mess of legal junction saying that we speak for the university. No, that's not correct. We speak for the students. We can urge Wichita State or we can change the wording saying Wichita State 
student government, but we are here because students elected us. The university, we do not get paid to be in this position. The university did not select us. The students elected us. Thank you. Chairperson Owens. Hi, folks. <clears throat> oh, I'm losing it as we're going along. Um, so I'll be short and quick. I'd love to have anyone who has proposed resolutions to bring them to the floor now, discuss them, talk about them. Um, in totality, I think, uh, Senator Bobbitt, you had, I can call you Andrew here. Uh, <laughs> Andrew, you had uh, quite a few uh, of uh, some I'm not entirely sure. Um, so I presume everyone here would appreciate that, you know, um, whatever the word is, appreciate that uh, clarity um, when it comes to that. Uh, additionally, I'd love uh, to expand more and get more viewpoint on Senator Pang's previous uh, discussion. Adriana. Um, Jasmine, I definitely see where you're coming from. I don't think any language change needs to happen other than the addition of a preambulatory clause that would just indicate urges Wichita State to recognize that the United States is behind. And then, um, and then those kinds of clauses that would allow that. I would also be open to asking um, our advisor if that is even necessary or if that language does need to change um, because I definitely see where you're coming from, Jasmine. Um, so when Jasmine talked to me about this, yes, as I read it, and I probably should have caught it earlier, so I apologize. You cannot pass something that says Wichita State University recognizes. Um, you're going to have to add student government because that is the only way that your, your power stops at the student government. Um, it doesn't go and exceed beyond that. Um, and so if you're going to attempt to um, alter language, one a, a recommendation would be that, yes, that the Wichita State University Student Government Association recognizes fill in the blank, or if you're going to attempt to say that you're urging them to, and by them I mean the university, uh, do some of these, be it further resolved, you're still going to have to add language in there somewhere that says the Student Government Association urges Wichita State University to do this, uh, but you cannot pass this bill at the moment um, without one of those changes um, because your, your power doesn't exceed in, in speaking on behalf of the university. Um, and as we would apply to um, the association resolution clause in the constitution, it has to specify the student government uh, because that is where student government passes bills, student government passes resolutions. You can't tell the university what to do. You're gonna have to add some sort of language in there about SGA. Hopefully that answers or clarifies the question. Senator Bobbitt. Just kind of weighing in on that issue, um, I personally would prefer student government or the addition of student government. I just think that think it works with the flow and structure of the um, resolution, just like dropping it in. Um, if people would prefer student government urges or something along that lines, um, we'll just have to go back through and make some grammatical changes to um, reflect that change in language. Um, I guess starting with the uh, um, amendments that I would like to propose, um, the first one is the uh, um, replacement of uh, um, whereas number three, which currently reads, um, according to AP News on February 20th, 2024, a majority 13 to one of the UN Security Council voted for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza. The United States was the only state to vote against this resolution. I would like to change that to uh, the United States abstained from the March 35th vote of the UN Security Council instead of joining the other 14 members in calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza. Um, but this still reflects the uh, therefore later in the um, resolution. It just goes back through and uh, um, shows that the United States has shifted its policy within the UN Security Council. Um, then, um, I, I kind of want to talk about the basis of some of my uh, um, further amendments before getting into them. I do recognize this is a very uh, contentious and serious issue, um, and because of the nature of this resolution, I did take it to members of the community, um, different organizations and group, asking for their feedback and how they felt about the university or student government making the statement on their behalf. 
and uh, the response was that uh, they felt that there needed to be a call for a ceasefire, but there was concern among different elements of the Wichita State community of the repercussions of such action should it not be um, done in a diplomatic and respectful way towards all of the different groups, both on campus and off campus. One of the uh, groups that I did reach out to was the JSA. Um, they uh, are supportive of the resolution. I know um, Kian's statement came off as a little, uh, um, a little aggressive, but uh, they uh, um, have indicated that they would support uh, this resolution with a couple amendments, just uh, kind of trying to find a little bit more of a middle ground while still being respectful of uh, the wishes and hurt that our campus community and uh, the international community is currently facing. Um, then I'm going to turn it over to um, uh, Senator Thompson to go over some of the uh, um, amendments that we've worked in collaboration with, and then I'll pick up whatever um, he doesn't get to. Um, before that, is it possible to allow for some conversation on the points that you uh, just made? Is that possible, Jay? Beautiful. Does anyone have anything to add to the discussion about Andrew's proposed amendments? Oh, Victoria. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you because I, I appreciate where you're, um, everything you're saying. Um, I, I do like the wording changes on the third whereas. I don't think it changes the general premise that the, uh, obviously, as you stated, the United States has changed their stance. Um, I think it additionally adds more credibility as AP News isn't necessarily um, as credible of a source as the United Nations. Um, it does provide, I think, when we talk about contentious resolutions, we want to ensure that it is thorough, concise, to the point, exactly what uh, we're meaning to come across, and I think that provides some clarity there. Um, so I do appreciate that, and I hope, um, you know, speaking to Greasy as well and to other um, people within the gallery, I hope that doesn't construe the meaning to change um, in any way that is, um, that is, disliked, um, but I think it still allows for the general uh, idea of that portion without, you know, altering the message, which is um, that the United Nations uh, is, you know, attempting to do something that the United States is incredibly behind on. Um, so that's my uh, stance on that little piece, but I'd love to see, you know, more from Jay as he continues on the amendments. Sorry, I just had to say that. Adriana. Before that, I'm so sorry, Jay. Um, I did want to say in terms of the amendment proposed by um, Andrew, I'm semi-hesitant, um, not because the amendment is bad. No, you um, had created like an addition that updates that part of the thing and while creating and still maintaining the same point of the resolution. Um, but I hesitate to um, indicate that while I understand the U.S. has made has changed their stance, that doesn't mean they have at all done what they should in this scenario, as well as the United Nations. So I, I'm i comfortable amending it, but as, al as long as we keep other parts of the resolution um, that do indicate and, and show that the U.S. might have changed their stance, the U.N. still has not done their job um, in terms of what's happening in Palestine. So as long as we keep that language further in the resolution, I'm comfortable with changing that language to provide a better source and more timely. That's all I have on that. Jay? Yeah, so right here uh, on the proposed amendment is the only location where it's changing the wording that much. Um, the rest of it is adding on to it um, and not much at all taking away from it. Um, on that first already proposed one, last week I asked a question of the author about um, what the intention was with the wording. And so the proposed amendment is just making that more structured and it's more recent. It mentions the March 25th vote, whereas the resolution mentions the February 20, 20th vote. Um, so same premise, same everything. Um, so moving forward into other amendments. So firstly, J 
Jay, before you do that, I'm, and I'm, not to distract you, but I just did. I'm sorry. Um, can you also email me those amendments so I can have them like actually the way you want them written, so you don't have to like repeat yourself again when we get back into the general session yeah. for the both of you, yeah. or anyone else that does. If you have anything, if you can email me those, it's a lot easier to do that than try and follow you when you say it. Yeah. Thank you. For Andrew, did you have something to say? Um, yes, I will email you that. I'm just going to forewarn you that there is going to be some language changes to the language changes. So, yeah. Jacob? Hi. Um, is it possible, Jay, for you to plug your computer into the big screen so we can see as you read? Please. Or like an email, so that way we could also like visually see it. Like email it to Gabe, Kylie or Gabe. Do you have to plug a, it in? Okay. Adriana. While we do that, I did want to talk about Jasmine's proposal uh, about editing parts of it to. Um, Okay, so the two options here to make it um, less confusing for those involved are to strike Wichita State University and then do Student Government Association recognizes um, blank, blank, blank for the um, action items or potentially um, do the Student Government Association and then it would be um, calls upon, urges, and then we would say Wichita State University and then action item. I'm comfortable with either. I know one holds more weight and so I understand that there might be um, hesitancy to just have the student government do it, but I understand the hesitancy to then have the SGA urge Wichita State to do something that they could just completely ignore. Um, so I think it, the importance, if we do the second one, is to then follow it up by action after the resolution is passed. This could include protests, this could include many other items um, that we should do. I'm comfortable with either, open to discussion. Jasmine. Uh, just responding back to you, I totally agree with you about the second one. There is a risk that the university doesn't hear our urge. There's a risk that they could ignore it. We, we go here because we chose this university. We represent the students. We, love, we are here because we love the university and our students we represent. And I do agree. I do like that second choice, the second option of if they do not ignore our urge, if they don't ignore our urges, to call for action, for protests and everything. So I definitely agree with you on that. Jordan. Yeah, sorry, I have a quick question. And that maybe a clarification um, from for Adriana and Jasmine. I guess my 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 advice would, that I'm going to give you next is continuing on how you'd answer this question. What are you hoping to do with this? Are we hoping to send this to just the university, um, or are you hoping to send this directly to our delegation? Like, what are you wanting to do with this? Because asking the university to to take a stance on something, one, it's their choice to make, um, right? That just how that works, um, and. Oh, sorry. Um, so I guess my my question is, what are you what are we trying to do with this if it passes? Are you trying to say that you want the student government to send this directly to every single one of our members of the federal delegation to our state representatives? Like, what are we trying? To, and maybe that wrong person to ask. That probably is probably Grace. Um, like, what are we trying to do with this if it passes? Because if you're saying you want the university to do something, okay, if you're saying that you want the student government to say and do something and send it to people who want, need to understand the, the student government's perspective at Wichita State, then, so I guess let me answer that first and then that might be depending on how I'm going to then say my next thing. Yeah, so we talked a little bit about um, changing that portion of the resolution, and we agree that it's best to change it to um, 
making it the uh, position of the SGA, as well as urging um, the university. Um, and what that is meant to do is to urge the state and beyond to um, you know, push for a ceasefire. Um, I, I hadn't even thought about sending um, an official position to our uh, state representatives. I think that is a very strong move, and I'd definitely be um, wanting that as well. So if that is, if the hope is you're trying to send it to those folks so that they understand the student government stands, then my advice to you would be that it needs to read Wichita State University Student Government Association recognizes, and that there needs to be, if you're, that your call to actions needs to say to whom we are asking for those call of actions to happen. If you're saying that we're calling for the end of the arms deal, um, who are we saying that to? Are we saying that to ourselves or are we saying that to our federal delegation who will vote on those things in, in DC or whatnot? So um, I would encourage you that as you're going through this conversation that you're also very clear about your end result of what you're trying to get to, to then determine the best language. But hearing that and recognizing that is as the author of your perspective, then I would encourage that the language says Wichita State University Student Government Association and then fixing the grammar in some of those pieces there. Um, because then that would require the student government to then do something with it when it's done. Um, whether that is sending a copy of it to X, Y, and Z people, uh, but that the, the stance is student governments, not the universities. And I don't know if I'm making any sense or making this worse, um, but in, other resolutions that we have, that the student government has sent to other folks outside of the university, there has been a clear, this is what we're asking you to do, and, or this is what we are making sure you understand that the, the representatives of the student body at Wichita State are saying this. Um, now I'm done. Hopefully that made sense. If not, I'm happy to explain it more, but sorry, Jay. Adriana. I'll make this quick, I'm so sorry. Um, I will say I did not write this resolution, so my understandings of the goals of it might not be perfect. Grace, you did say that really well. I was going to say that um, strategically, I think it makes most sense to have what um, Gabriel said about um, the student government doing it, because if we pass this in the student government, they have to do it. Um, but if we urge WSU to do something, they could just completely ignore it. Um, I will say also that adding um, other people to send it to in the final copy would make a lot of sense, especially when we talk about the Kansas legislator um, and those resolutions in it. We can name those people and send this resolution to it um, because we want this resolution, and I'm sure everyone does, to step outside of the walls of this room. And so I think just doing that would make a lot of sense. I don't know exactly who all of those people would be, and I would also ask potentially if we can do like add those people if we have to add those people now or if we need to add or if we can add those people after the resolution is passed it'd have to be now Got well, it. not now but like in tonight's meeting before you pass the final version I'll, I'll work on that right now Victoria I presume as such that obviously this body wants to kind of mimic um, the solutions and types of resolutions through the UN bodies as well. Um, coming from that also, uh, I presume as such that we'd want something like, uh, be it further resolved that the Wichita State University Student Government Association and then just changes each one to recognizes and uh, calls for um, all of those would remain the same, intent stays the same, everything stays the same, but if we want to really um, say something directly to you know, our um, public officials, any of those things, we can make a separate be it for the result um, that indicates that without having to change the general premise of all the other points, um, which would allow for that call to action point um, to still be there and to discuss that uh, without changing um, so much of the other points. Potential idea? Um, We'd have to figure out the wording and such, but I'm gonna point it to Jay to go to his amendments. Evelyn. Uh, so, um, Victoria, um, about that, or uh, the, uh, sorry, the adding another, be it further resolved, or, um, do you, wait, I can just say this to everyone. Um, 
So I think having a, a another be it further resolved that WSU SGA calls for um, WSU, um, the Kansas state government, and the U.S. federal government to um, adopt a similar stance to the um, seat or to the uh, ceasefire as we are. Andrew. I promise we'll get to Jay, but um, I'm just going to ask the question just for everyone to consider. Um, by including the, the Kansas State Legislature, our federal representatives, we are ceding control of the resolution. Um, and I guess my question to you guys as senators is, uh, are you prepared for a response? And does it serve the university and the student body as a whole when that response comes? Victoria. I can say my opinion on that, Andrew, uh, is that whatever response uh, obtained, oh, and I also just don't generally believe that adding these public officials is ceding the resolution to them. I believe response is kind of the point. Uh, getting any kind of response would mean we are listened to, and I believe um, it's not untoward to think that a contentious resolution would be met with negative response, and I think, again, that's kind of the point. Um, so I personally, and I presume fi by the many people behind me, um, are willing to let that happen um, and are okay with that. Um, so for me, when I think of the community, uh, I think of the people behind me who have come every single session to talk about a resolution. Um, so I know that the Kansas legis legislature have already published a response and a stance um, in many and so few words. Um, so I can already predict what the response will be. Um, but honestly, I'll be blunt, I don't care. I would rather we submit the resolution and say this is what we believe <laughs> than um, not submit it uh, because there may be ire from public officials. But that is just my personal opinion, and I presume from clapping the position from the people behind me, but I'd love to see more response from other people, and I do appreciate your uh, point of view, Andrew. Adriana. I'm so sorry, Jay. My heart goes out to you, for real. I'm so sorry. Okay, um, so I did a little bit of Googling, guys. And um, so, the parts of the resolution where we mention other like organizations, people, Kansas legislature, et cetera, we mention Kansas public universities to urge them to have similar resolutions. We can put all of those in the resolution so that we can send it to them. We can also put the um, leadership of those a part of the 6030 bill, I believe, if I'm reading correctly. Um, as well as those who are our representatives in the House in our federal government. Um, I have those names. It would be a lot to edit. So if someone could please help me with that, that would be awesome. But I think we need to decide how far we want to go up and how many people we want to add. Um, because sending this resolution, a lot of these people cannot respond. I'm not saying that that's okay that they don't respond, but it's just how the cookie crumbles. But um, hopefully, we will get response from other people, students like us from other public universities who do care about this. And so um, we just need to figure out how many of those to add and how to do it in a way where we can pass this resolution. Because that's a lot of names. So um, I'm going to create a Google Doc, and it's going to list all of those names. And I'm going to share it with people who want to. And then we can just quickly add those um, for interests of time in the resolution. I'm going to be doing that. Okay, related actually to Victoria's point, I'm also not scared to piss some people off. It's fine. Um, one of the amendments that I'll get to when I get to it does address the line about the House resolution, but we don't want to remove that, but I do want to address like what specifically about it we are den denouncing, because not all of it is bad. Um, there are parts of it that I completely understand why you know there's disagreement with it, um, but I just like for us to specify what. But I'll get to that. So the first one, 
um, is addressing the first line of our therefore be it resolves um, when we acknowledge the annihilation of Gaza um, we want to word that as Wichita State University Student Government Association recognizes and acknowledges the war in Gaza which has resulted in disproportionate civilian death property damage injuries and famine and I believe uh, Senator Lewis would like to make a change to that when we get back into the session um, but that's Proposal one, two refers to a new one, um, adding a line thanking the um, one of our speakers in public forum, because that's definitely something we should include, but um, calling for the opening of humanitarian routes and the delivery of aid without impediment. Um, I think that's a really important one. Thirdly, referring to the arms deal, um, I think it's important for us to be very specific about what we're asking for. Um, and so I've worded that as um, Wichita State University Student Government Association calls for an end to the unconditional armament of Israel and an end to the, and an end to the bombardment of the Gaza Strip. And then we can even specify that that specifically we want to send a federal dele delegation or we can adjust that at the end, either or. Um, then referring to, so no changes to this one. As Adriana um, mentioned, we should send this to other public universities. Um, that's a line that was written in by Gracie, so that was a good one to include. Um, and then the one referring to the Kansas legislature's reg resolution, um, we have wording stating uh, that we want to denounce the partiality of the Kansas House resolution, but I also have wording offering that um, we urge blank, blank, and blank to take a similar stance or pass a ceasefire resolution with similar language. Um, that a way we um, kind of add to what has already been stated um, and denouncing the parts of it that we disagree with at the same time. Um, again, by being respectful to the different sides of that. Um, and then finally, the last line um, not that there's like a huge disagreement with this line, but it's hard to implement comp compliance with an organization. Um, we can condemn genocide, but I don't know. The wording of it just made it kind of confusing on how we as student government comply with it, um, but we can look at a different wording if that's what we want to do. Um, so those are the offered amendments. That's all. I'll take it. You know, questions or clarifying comments. Adriana. Hi. Um, I just wanted to talk to everyone, especially Jay, because you're editing, um, which universities that we want to send this to. So, so far, I have the University of Kansas. Um, and I can, like, share this with you, Jay, so it's easier. Um, Emporia State University, Kansas State University, and Fort Hayes University. If anyone has any ideas of what else we should add, it looks like. Sophie? Um, we could all, this could also make it a lot easier. If we wanted to just do our, um, the Kansas Board of Regents schools specifically, which are the ones that you're listing off, or if we wanted to do, Gabriel was saying it's the system or the uh, KBOR system, which includes our um, community colleges, um, all public higher institutions, higher ed institutions in the Kansas, in, in Kansas, including our um, community colleges. It's just depending on who you're wanting to send it to, if you want to do our four-year schools or include those community colleges. Victoria. Um, on what you're editing also, Jay, I wrote, uh, be it further resolved that the Wichita State University Student Government Association urges that Wichita State University, comma, other public universities in Kansas, comma, which I think simplifies it a bit, but we can make a specified list. Um, I think that would make it easier for people who have to send this resolution to everybody. Um, and then I said the Kansas legislature, and then and, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I did have questions, Jay, if you're ready, on some of the proposed amendments. You good? Okay. Um, starting bottom up, on the last um, little bit that you talked about, um, the wording. Uh, I did want to clarify the wording a little bit, so I agree with you there, um, but I, I wondered what changes you wanted to make to alter that piece. Oh. 
Uh, no, the, the one you said that, oh boy, oh boy, I'll find it. Uh, second, the last, be it further resolved. Is that the one you? This one. Hey, Andrew, could you duck down just the scotiest bit? The compliance with international human rights organizations on. That's okay. Um, and that one, I agree with you that we need to change comply with, um, to indicate comply with who um, and what organizations uh, to add clarity there and to add specificity, which I think is important. Yeah, and like in um, what way, yeah. Yeah, exactly, that's what uh, I wonder. So I'd love to hear other people's feedback on that. I, I presume they mean the United Nations um, and maybe even Amnesty International, other um, international human rights organizations at work um, but obviously moving to Grace because you wrote it to see what uh, specific organizations you're wanting to add to that. Okay, so yes, for sure, Amnesty International, as I've been getting quite a bit of um, information from them. Um, uh, in my original speech, I'd probably have to pull it up, but in Amnesty International had made a joint statement with 16 human rights organizations, so maybe we could do that. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so maybe that. Victoria? Um, additionally, we can reference previous resolutions passed by the Security Council of the United Nations in, I would say, um, 2018, which condemned, and I know controversial topic, condemned the um, uh, usage of food and aid as a political tool um, to um, which, you know, uh, as we talk about later and earlier when we talk about famine, um, we can reference that resolution also or that um, piece of legislation um, and say we want to comply with uh, and use certain wording like that to ensure um, that would add specificity, but I do uh, like what you talked about with Amnesty International. Andrew? I would offer alternative language, um, perhaps be it further resolved that Wichita State University student government um, join with international human rights uh, um, organizations in calling for the prevention of genocide in Gaza. Could you say that wording one more time? be it further resolved that Wichita State University join um, international um, human rights organizations in calling for the prevention of genocide in Gaza. Evelyn. In the first uh, be it resolved, um, just so that I don't need to amend it later. Could we change civilian to non-combatant? Um, I think there's a difference between civilian and non-combatant, and non-combatant is broader and uh, the violation. Adriana. Okay, this is, I have two things. Um, one, in terms of the public universities, we could do the thing that Sophie suggested, which I think makes a lot of sense, which would include community colleges and other people. Um, so I would request that we add that. Would that language just be KBOR? Or, um, I'm not totally sure what that would look like. That might be a question for Sophie or Gabriel. Okay, and yes, and then the second one is in terms of um, HR 6030, the resolution, they have five main sponsors. Do we want to put them and send this, the bill to them? Um, because I looked them up and I have their emails and we can definitely send this to them. I don't think they'll respond, but um, we can still send it to them. Um, and I just wanted people's opinion <laughs> on whether or not we want to do that or if we could just send it to our Kansas, like, um, board in general? Uh, I don't know. Based on what we're calling for, I think it'd be more productive if we sent it to people who are more likely to back it, because then we could potentially um, get that support for them to put something forward. Um, I do think the people who wrote the 
6031 would probably not see it. Does anyone else? Victoria? Um, I'm starting to write a proposed ad to um, a little piece of it to add uh, reference to the previous resolution I talked about. It was passed in 2018. It's S-RES-2417, uh, which condemns the starving of civilians uh, as a political tool. That might be a separate um, little piece, but um, thoughts? What are you trying to to say with that? Yeah, um, I think uh, as most people here should know, or you know, will know, um, when we think about uh, food aid and aid in general being, you know, uh, limited and being taken away from uh, those in need and those in conflict, um, often in, in specifically in this scenario as well, being used as a political tool, um, starving civilians is a war crime, um, and I think. Uh, having the um, university, um, thank you, sorry, I'm reading while I'm talking, um, having the uh, university not only condemn that, but also further that, uh, adds for more discussion on the extent of um, the brutal treatment of those in Gaza. Um, when we think of food, we think of a necessity, and we think of, um, you know, something that we, we go every day with. And when you think of, you know, uh, religious holidays that are occurring um, and that are being limited um, access to food, it is only, um, to me, important that we continue to talk about it and add it to the resolution. But that is my point of view. If someone else would like to share, I would be most appreciative. Gracie? Uh, so I think that's a great idea. So first, um, you're just wanting to add that on to um, which whereas? Um, I think it would be a separate whereas. Um, it would just read something to the extent of reaffirming resolution S-RES-2417 um, uh, by the United Nations Security Council, um, which condemns the starving of civilians as a method of warfare. So as an added portion? Yes, All right. not taking anything away, not adding from anything else, but a separate one. Can you repeat the ID yes. of that? The, um, which part? The, I'm not even like sure what it's called. Yeah, the Security okay. Council's Yeah, so resolution. it's S, and then it'd be dash, R-E-S, all capital, uh, the slash one, this one, yeah. Um, and then it's 2417. So the S will also, also have the, what is that one called? Backslash. Yeah, the backslash. And then it's just 2417, not 12417. Thank you very much. So this is right. Andrew? Yeah. Um, okay, can we change that to read as a sentence? Perhaps, um, whereas uh, access or whereas limiting uh, um, food aid is a war crime reaffirmed by the United Nations Security Council Resolution uh, 2417. Um, could you just Rewind. follow follow what I'm going to say to you? Is that okay? Um, it will read uh, the Wichita State University Student Government Association. Is this a precursor clause or is this a resolution? Because you word one one way, you word one right. the other. I'm getting what you're saying. I'm picking it up, putting it back down. Um, just put reaffirming resolution, and we'll change it after we get this wording specified. Reaffirming resolution, and then you'll have the resolution, S-RES-2417, um, passed by the United Nations Security Council in May of 2018 which condemns the starving of civilians as a method of warfare. Now it's a sentence. Okay. 
I had to read it a couple times to see the sentence, but I'm there. Andrew? Just a proced or procedural thing, but can you add a um, security council before resolution? Say that again. Can you please add security council before resolution? Um. Oh, okay, I see. Does anyone else have anything to add before we move back into formal Senate? Before we move back, I do want to like hammer out what we're going to say about Senta leadership. Are we going to address it in the phrase, or are we just going to do it in like a, um, this is sent to X, Y, and Z? Gracie? So I do have a little bit more I want to say um, about that, just so we can have that, all of that clarified. Um, so with uh, the sending it to, um, I believe we would want it to be all of the um, Kansas State Legislature's um, members of the House and the Senate. Um, however, uh, the State Legislature has ended as of last week, so I think we should add a, maybe something about um, repeatedly sending um, a statement to them uh, until, like, uh, elections are this year, so that would be important, and also uh, till the uh, start of session uh, next year, or perhaps at that point. Um. So um, I guess this would be adding on to it, because I guess it doesn't exactly seem like a super clear um, urge. So this would be the statement of the student government being sent to uh, leadership, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I guess we'll have to talk about how we want to do that. Um, if Do you guys want that to be a one-time thing or at a certain specific point? I was going to ask something similar. The entire legislature would be a lot of people. Are we capable of that? I imagine so, but I just want to hear are we capable? Yes, we are capable wondering. to do anything and everything. Um, but it is a lot of people. Um, and I want to just remind, this resolution will expire next, when, next Thursday at noon. Um, therefore, if it's not done before then, it will not get sent out because it has expired. Because a new session will gavel in on the 18th. Next, you know what I mean. A new session will start the 18th at noon. Um, so I would just remind you all about about that, that this only has the uh, the authority to exist with this session. Um, on March, on April 18th at noon, all of these people can ignore it because it carries no weight anymore. So just a FYI to you all. But yes, can we send it to all of them? Yes, if there are specific people that you want us to send it to, I think that'd be the other thing. But if your expectation is that it goes to all I don't know how many members are in the state legislature, I should know that because government, I love government, I can tell you the Congress, but I don't know the state, then sure, just FYI on the second piece that I just said. So to your point, Gracie, about saying waiting to the election, this resolution would expire next week. Adriana. In terms of H.R. 6030, um, I know you said we don't want to send it to the people who voted yes for that, but I did find who, the people who voted nay for it. It's 14 people, so we could potentially send it to the people who voted um, no for the H.R. 6030. Um, just a thought, potentially ruminate on that one. Victoria? Um, I appreciate your point. I presume we'd want to send it to everybody, even the people who vote yes, as a to say, hey, this is what your community wants. Um, so I would personally appreciate it being sent to everybody, yays and nays. But you know, I like I'd appreciate other viewpoint on that. 
um, when it comes to that particular point, Jay, uh, when it talks about partiality, um, could you elaborate a little bit um, on what exactly is the purpose of that part? I understand, but um, if you could provide s specifics on what we're denouncing, um, that yeah. would be appreciated. Let me pull 6030 back up. I had it open the other day. Um, for the most part, it doesn't come with a like very combative tone, um, but it is very one-sided. Um, so the partiality that we're referring to is that it doesn't offer any sort of solace or uh, condemnation, any support for the other side, um, which I think is the part of it that we really wanted to denounce. Um, if I'm wrong, let me know if I'm wrong. But um, So uh, along with it being completely one-sided, it also has some fully untrue information in it. And I could have one of um, my folks in the back elaborate on that if you would like. That's a question for everyone, not just for me. Andrew? I'm gonna send that one to Gabe. Um, do members of the gallery retain speaking rights? Only in Senate, not in committee of the whole. And only on particular, so in this case, in this bill, there's someone in the audience who wants to talk about it, sure, but you can't do it in committee of the whole. Um, so basically, um, I don't have it pulled up, I can pull it up. But there is a section of the whereas that um, I kind of uh, believe, oh, thank you so much, Evelyn. So um, this part here that says, um, there is a whereas about uh, Hamas has burned, uh, murdered, raped, beheaded, and disfigured over one, uh, 1,400 Israelis, including hundreds of women, children, and elderly throughout the southern portion of Israel while concurrently launching indiscriminate rocket uh, attacks uh, across the entirety of Israel. And then um, the second whereas that is included as an and statement, um, Hamas deliberately and systemically used viol sexual violence against women as a weapon. And um, this is just some stuff that has been uh, proven false. Uh, and um, I don't have all of the information on that. Uh, if there's a point when we go back into full Senate where I might be able to um, legally ask um, somebody from the back to elaborate, I would uh, hope for that. Um, so you, that you guys may have all of the information. Victoria. Is there a way to politely say and acknowledge the bias within that resolution? And is that uh, the way you're try attempting to phrase with the partiality piece? Because just reading it, I, I personally didn't read the resolution 6030, and I will after this, of course. Um, but, you know, I'm after hearing, you know, thank you for sharing that. Um, my goodness, I would appreciate some clarity when it comes to how, how verbiage that we can say that it is not factual information or proved incorrect or uh, that there are, uh, that there is bias or, I don't know, someone please <laughs> provide perspective, thank you. I mean, it's difficult for many of us in this room to provide factual perspective. Um, so I think that has to be acknowledged too, but definitely some of those numbers are outdated and many have been proven to be um, egregiously exploded in number. Um, not everything in the resolution is false, though. There is there's historical information. It touches on, you know, um, the ages of hostages or um, the num exact number is remains un un unaccounted for. Um, it talks about anti-Semitism. It talks about um, the connection between the United States and Israel. Um, so, I mean, overall, yes, it it does include issues that um, 
you know, make it biased. And so I think that's the part of the, the resolution that we're wanting for them to, I liked the wording that you used, but them to recognize the bias in it. What was the word that you used? It was. Might be my understanding. Um, stop me if I'm wrong. That um, they said recognizing the bias of house mm -hmm. uh, uh, or potential bias, or um, we could also use the words um, denounces out of date or something, something. We could also use hyperbolic in terms of the information that was used in um, a way that was exaggerated. A potential way to phrase it, I think, uh, additionally, is adding, of course, the Wichita State University Student Government Association, and then providing maybe uh, urges for updated, non-biased, factual information regarding the situation um, as a, maybe an, um, an effort of goodwill to say, hey, we would appreciate a resolution that shows actual, like, factual numbers that is non-biased, that is updated, um, if that makes sense. Um, I know it makes sense, but you know what I mean, if that's amenable to everyone. Andrew? I would just like to ask that we focus on the you know, what, like, aspects of the bill that we can achieve. Um, I understand the desire to ask the state legislature to go back and uh, fix these issues, but with the session currently being uh, um, on recess or not in session, as well as the expiration of the current so, um, Senate session, I would just ask that we not focus on stuff we know will not be achieved in the next eight days. Gracie. So I do have a couple things. Um, so uh, yeah, for sure, Jay, there's some stuff in there that probably should not be taken out. Um, however, your point about it being very biased is true. And uh, the ending statement where it says that um, the people of Kansas um, stand with Israel is just um, not fair on um, Arab Kansans. I think that it kind of sets up some very demeaning um, implications towards Arab Kansans and is certainly not made with their safety in mind. Um, so if we could, I guess, add to it um, that they should um, add some of those portions to equate to their uh, portions about Israel, I think that would be important. And then secondly, uh, yes, session is over, is currently the veto session. Um, I would have to ask um, Advisor Fonseca if, uh, if there's a procedure for upholding this, um, uh, uh, what's uh, the term, um, position of the SGA into the next session, or if there is not one. Um, it'd have to be reintroduced in the next session for them to go through the exact same thing you're going through right now. Um, so your resolutions only carry the weight of the term it's passed in. Um, and so if there is a desire for um, this to be the stance of the next student government, then that student government will also have to go through this process of a new resolution or the same one being introduced in the new format for the new session for them to go through this process um, and vote on it for themselves. So you, like you it wouldn't carry into the next year. It would automatically expire at noon on the 18th. Victoria. Um, on um, what you previously said, Andrew, I do appreciate your perspective as well as we do have eight days um, through that. Um, I was operating under the assumption, I wasn't sure if any other people of the body were, um, that quite a few of us are coming back and that this will be carried on. I know I personally am coming back and will reintroduce this resolution, which is a promise from me to everybody here. Um, this is coming back. We're going to see it again. <laughs> Um, so I do appreciate that perspective, Andrew. Um, I, I will say, though, uh, with that in mind, I hope that that um, allows for us to kind of readdress our goals here, which is to make sure that this resolution is as, you know, impactful as possible, but also correct, factual, um, and, you know, represents the community that we are here to serve. Um, 
on the note of reintroducing resolution, as I previously said, I don't think it's a problem. As I previously stated, this is coming back. Um, so I think we do need to address it now. And I'd much rather spend hours in here, I know people wanna go home, but hours in here making sure it's perfect um, than pass a resolution that is subpar. That's all. So I kind of think the combination of these two lines kind of captures our conversation without being, um, without stepping on too many toes, but also still being um, directive enough that we're covering our bases. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on these lines? Urgence. Andrew? Could you specifically go over once more why um, we are urging the Kansas legislature and U.S. Congress to pass a ceasefire resolution on behalf of Arab and Palestinian Kansans? Oh, my bad. That's a good point. I was trying to keep everything together. We already addressed um, federal delegation earlier in the resolution, so we can just leave that at Kansas legislature. Andrew. Um, with that one, I was specifically referencing um, Arab and Palestinian Kansans. What about it? Uh, just why specifically are we uh, um, uh, asking the legislature to act on behalf of this specific group? Gracie. I think because it's the right thing to do. Um, there's no room for potential racism against uh, this group, and uh, it is the job of the Kansas State Legislature to acknowledge that and keep that in mind when creating legislation. Adriana. I think also we need to recognize the reason why we thought a resolution 6030 was inadequate um, is because it didn't mention half of the people who were affected by the conflict. And so um, by mentioning it here, we can not only recognize that they need to pass a resolution that includes those individuals, but also um, does not leave them out as they did in the previous resolution. Ooh, Victoria. Um, this is a little bit of a side note. I don't wanna misconstrue your tent here, um, uh, Andrew. Do you mean to say that you're wanting, how would you, propose it to be changed or altered, I'd love to know. Because um, personally, as it stands, I do, I, I do like the wording. I think um, maybe the wording can be clarified at the end, uh, the bit that says, with similar language. Um, Jay, are you meaning with similar language as a resolution presented here? Or is that what you're in? OK, I assumed as such, but I wasn't sure. But um, yeah. Andrew? I understand your intent. I just personally don't read the clause to express that intent, if that makes any sense. So we could rearrange the sentence and make it read so that it's um, regarding those affected who were not already represented in the prior legislation type of language. Um. Victoria? I thought maybe wording could be changed to alter it because um, I want to get down to the goal of this little piece so we're not, you know, talking past each other and not quite getting what each other mean. Um, to, but I'm not sure if I like that change. I do, I didn't mind having. Um, Arab and Palestinian Kansas and those affected 
Um, uh, but I don't know. I'm not sure. I'd like to get others' point of view. Josh? I just wanted to <clears throat> throw it out there as well. I think we do need to be pretty strict on what we put for resolution 6030 because if we're gonna be sending it to both parties that voted yes and no, when, when you think about it, they could possibly look at it and try and uh, strew some of the stuff in there to try and fit their agenda, which sounds bad, but that's how politics is, but we do need to be pretty strict. And I also agree with with having that where it is saying the, like the, the Arab and Palestinian as well as not those re represented. Gracie. I think you're absolutely right about that. That is a serious concern. Um, maybe we should, I don't know, make the language more inclusive, if that makes sense. Like this. Evelyn? In the be it further resolved above that section that you just changed about 6030, um, maybe we could mention the specific uh, lines that we disagree with, although I guess the nature of the entire thing is biased. Andrew? I would caution us against going through 6030 line by line and writing a counter to it or a response to it. I think it kind of takes us away from our purpose of tonight. And uh, I, I just don't think that uh, going through uh, 6030 clause by clause will be a productive use of our time. Victoria. I'm back again. Um, I appreciate that, uh, Evelyn, that point of view. Um, I do semi-agree with Andrew that I don't think that's necessary because I think I, I do think this, be it for the resolve that Jay added, really does encompass what we're attempting to um, without instructing specific course, course of action, like you must change this and this and this, um, which is not at all our purview or a possibility. Um, and if we're worried about efficacy of this resolution, um, but uh, I, Another point to that, Jay, that last bit, the with similar language as provided, I like that change. I would like maybe a, um, the and other Kansans not represented with prior legislation with um, similar um, language provided within this resolution or something. Do y'all get it, what I'm saying? Something that specifies that it means like this resolution right here, right now, if you know what I'm saying, just to be concise. I'll move it to the start of the sentence. Thank you. Can you add with some language as provided in this resolution on behalf of, and then we'll read it from there to see if that makes sense. It's slightly clunky, it's if that clunky. makes sense. Yeah. I get where you're coming from, Victoria. I don't want them to misconstrue it as 60-30 um, in any way, but I think what Jay put before made sense, but I don't know. I don't want them to misconstrue, if that makes sense. I'm more than, sorry, Kylie, I don't mean to, um, but uh, I'm more than okay with having it as it originally was, as long as it doesn't, as you said, made it clunky. Because <laughs> um, I don't really mind. It construed the full intent, but I think it's okay how it was. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate that. Is that less clunky? That's beautiful. Way, way, way better, I think, personally. Okay. Cool. <laughs> okay, 
so the other lines as well. Did we, Kylie, if I may, okay, um, do we want to change the part that Andrew wanted to add in terms of the first whereas, or? Andrew, do you still want to add that uh, the amendment, the first whereas, to, to change the part of that about the US? Okay, then if you could tell Jay what it was so we could type that. I think this is already that. Gracie? Um, yeah, I'm not some, sure if this is something we discuss when we go back into Senate or right now. Um, so I can't let the version of this um, that um, does not uh, acknowledge uh, a genocide. Um, we, I went into this um, that I cannot uh, allow it to be called the war in Gaza. It has to be the genocide on Gaza. And I'm just wondering if we can, like. It's. It still does at the bottom. OK. Um, so at the first, there's certain parts of it that do call it um, a war in Gaza. And I'm just wondering if we can change that. General tally. Genocide. Do it. Okay. I did want to ask real quick those uh, who are part of this legislating body, who I know um, probably agree with what we've had so far, if they want to comment or agree with what we've done, because I know you guys have to um, vote on it too, so um, maybe we can get like a general consensus before we move out of, um, yeah, go ahead. I have a proposal. Do we want to just go line item by line item and just take like, I don't know, like a hand vote or something like that, and just kind of gauge how we like each one, and then sure. we can move out of Committee of the Whole. Sure, yeah. Yeah. How do we feel about the first whereas statement? Raise your hand if you like it. If you don't like it, Abstaining? Okay. The second whereas statement, raise your hand if you like it. If you don't like it. If you're abstaining. Okay. Before the we move on, I just want to clarify. These are just the ones that we're proposing changes to. There's mm -hmm. also the ones that we're not proposing changes to, which are already in the resolution. Continue. Mm -hmm. um, the third. Uh, first resolution. The further resolved, yeah, that one. Raise your hand if you like it. If you don't like it. If you're abstaining. Okay. The second further resolved. Raise your hand if you like it. If you don't like it, if you're abstaining, okay. The third further resolved, raise your hand if you like it, if you don't like it, if you're abstaining, okay. The fourth further resolved, raise your hand if you like it. 
if you don't like it, if you're abstaining. Okay. The fifth for the resolved, raise your hand if you like it. If you don't like it, if you're abstaining. Okay. The sixth for the result, raise your hand if you like it. If you don't like it, if you're abstaining. Okay. The last for the result, raise your hand if you like it. If you don't like it, if you're abstaining. Do we want to just go back with the original whereas and further resolve? Oh, sorry, Gracie. Sorry, I think I misread um, one of those whereases. Does that say the unconditional armament of Israel? So uh, saying that student government is okay with continuing to arm Israel, is that what that means? I mean, that's a complicated answer. I feel like it shouldn't, I mean, we sh can we figure out what that means? Because that's a pretty big statement to make, uh, yes or no, either way. So if we say armament or disarmament, like, we You're should know what that about means. Where was it again? Right here. Whoa. Okay, sorry. Were you going to say something, Jay? I mean, it depended if there was still a question. Oh. Uh, um, in more plain, plain language, we could say the sending of arms to Israel. I think broadly, you're not going to get every single person on Wichita State's campus to agree with that. This is overarching to try to find the middle ground. This was part of the language to find middle ground because armament should not be used on Gaza, um, but it is, it's not consistent with international treaties, expectations, um, alliances, to end complete and utter supply from the United States just because that is a lot of national defense around the world. Um, but if we want to further clarify that armament should not be used on Gaza or the Palestinians, then we'd be happy with, with that, yeah. Victoria? On that note, I would like maybe changing in wording when it comes to, because unconditional is such a loose term and doesn't have a lot of clarity or meaning beyond it until we give it meaning. So um, I'm kind of on the same okay. area of where Grace was talking about. Of It doesn't uh, provide specificity when we're talking about it. So maybe some wording changes can clarify that. Maybe we can add a portion where we s like say that it's like ext like very highly being used on the non-combatants um, or something like that. Like maybe like a comma or something. I don't know. I kind of feel like the second part of that kind of covers or like go, goes with it because we say an end to the bombardment of the Gaza Strip um, which implies that 
the armament is being used in the bombardment of the Gaza Strip. Um, do we want to mention non-combatants again? Because we can. Victoria? I guess to me the issue here is uh, efficacy of this portion of it, of uh, what does it mean and what are we asking? Um, because currently as it stands, um, it looks like the Student Government Association uh, is calling for a, a super vague general, um, th if you know what I'm saying. So I would prefer, you know, specifying, even if we have to specify what, do you know what I'm saying? Like, um, so that it can have more of a call to action. So, yeah, but I'm not sure how that wording would be changed. I think an M dash would be appropriate here. Um, because I see the, the language difference. The unconditional armament of Israel on and an N2. But we could be more clear. Let's see. Um, You just say four dash and the armament of Israel four dash and an end to the bourbon. I can't do an M dash in my notes, so pretend this is an M dash. Gracie? And then I just have one last thing. Um, on that very last for the resolved, um, so the Amnesty International's um, Secretary General was quoted as saying uh, that they had reason to believe that the threshold of genocide was already met, so it wouldn't be the prevention. Um, so I think, can we change that to the end of genocide in Gaza or something? Andrew? The international community has not made a positive determination of genocide with regards to Gaza. It is the opinion of several international bodies that the criteria for genocide has not been met. Such opinions include those of uh, the International Court of Justice, as well as uh, legal scholars and uh, experts in the field of genocide. Thank you. Avalon? Can we say the cessation or prevention of the genocide, um, that entire phrase, uh, in place of prevention? The cessation, how do you spell that? This, no. <laughs> Help. Good up to now. Okay. It's C E S S A T I O N. Okay. Sorry, I was doing good up until now. I don't know every word. Also, good word, Evelyn. Very good word. Victoria? Andrew, I know you wanted to add on the whereas, that last one. I'm, I'm moving on to a different portion, sorry. Uh, that last one about the Security Council resolution, uh, the reaffirming Security Council resolution, but I believe it's a little bit germane as it literally, uh, after clarifies that it's passed by the United Nations Security Council. Um, and I believe that in summation, you know, uh, shows that obviously, it, and also the S is Security Council, dash R-E-S. That's, well, you know this, Andrew, but. 
is that okay, or do you still think the verbiage is better with the Security Council resolution before? I am indifferent to what you feel is appropriate. Beautiful. Take it out. Which part? Uh, just have reaffirming resolution S dash R E S dash two four one seven. I think it makes it a little bit more concise. Okay. Are there any other thoughts on anything else? Do we want to move out of Committee of the Whole then? Okay, I move that we exit Committee of the Whole. Are there any objections? No? Okay. So, do you want to just stay up there for that or are you sure. good to do you down? want me to email? So we're going to move back into the debate period for this legislation. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak in debate? Senator Bobbitt. Since we more or less have a consensus on or understanding of how each of these folks will go, can we um, adopt this language as a single amendment? <laughs> sure. So, does someone still need to propose this as an amendment? Yes, right, because, it, okay. All right. <laughs> Do you need me to read it all? No. Okay. Um, I move to amend, um, okay, I was gonna be fancy, but I'm not gonna do that. Um, I move to amend the resolution to, um, change the lines that um, are amended in the proposed language and add the lines that are proposed in the language. Is there a second? Okay, would you like to speak on this amendment? I think it, uh, we've spoken enough. I would agree. Is there, <laughs> is there anyone else who would like to speak on this amendment? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna go into the voting period. The voting window is open. With 17 yes, zero no's, and two abstentions, the motion or the amendments pass. So now we're gonna move back into the debate period on the legislation as a whole. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in debate on the amended legislation? Um, Chairperson Owens. Um, so folks, we did it uh, so far. Cross our fingers. Um, but I want to talk a little bit because I was just in New York at the United Nations representing this school at um, a model UN conference and it was a wonderful time, beautiful stuff, but uh, while I was there, the committee I was in was ECOSOC, which to those who are not familiar is the Economic and Social Council. Our topic was um, hu uh, f hunger, famine, um, and access to food, which I'm, I'm sure you can see how this relates to the resolution we're currently talking about. And you know, uh, we represented Kazakhstan, which uh, was very exciting. Um, but when I think about my time there, and I think about sitting on, you know, in those seats uh, representing a delegation, and talking about uh, hunger and famine and uh, humanitarian aid, and ensuring that uh, those in conflict receive aid, it was a huge, uh, you know, like a, almost a silence over the room when anything was referenced to uh, Gaza, anything when it came to those uh, currently representing the delegation of Israel. Uh, and of course, we didn't have anyone representing uh, Palestine, which is often common in these conferences as um, they have no voting power. Um, but it was really disheartening to watch so many people from so many different countries come to a room to talk about humanitarian aid and hunger and famine and not so few and were comfortable enough to discuss um, 
everything that's happened in Gaza, which is so disheartening. And to close that ceremony in the United Nations and to sit in those chairs that so many delegations do um, and to watch as like, we only in passing mention Gaza was so disheartening and so upsetting and, and I'm sure so much more for those affected within those communities. Um, and so it's very, very important to not only me, but those within um, this body, in this room, in this community, that uh, we don't do that. Because silence is deafening, and it says so much, and it is despicable to be blunt. Um, and I'm very, very deeply proud of everyone within this body and all the people who have come to share their stories and their grief with the group here. Um, and I'm so excited to watch as this resolution, cross our fingers, is passed. And the solutions we continue to gain um, as we bring this to higher uh, bodies. Um, and to watch as we bring it back again to reconfirmed within this body. So important. Don't be like those delegations that represent, <laughs> that represent communities um, and be silent. Because that is not what we're here to do. And to, and to do it all. Because if you're serving the, the body and if you're serving the community and you're listening to students, then listen to the people who are coming here and pleading with you um, to hear them. And to all those watching also within this live stream, thank you for watching. Um, and do more, be loud, um, say something, because something is better than nothing. Um, but yeah, that's all I have to say with that. Um, good going, y'all. person Adriana Owens. Hi guys. Um, I just wanted to say that um, not only am I really proud about everyone who's here today, but I did want to tell everyone that this is just the beginning. And um, w once this passes, when it passes, we have to continue this work in the next session and the next if we have to and the next after that if we have to. And um, I want to then end this little speech um, with a moment of silence for everyone who's affected during um, this conflict and this genocide, real quick. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak and debate? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna move into the voting period. The voting window is open. Advisor Fonseca. Um, the thing you still forgot to do is who is this going to be sent to? You have to add it in the bill in order for us to do it. Chairperson Thompson. Um, I think overarching we can add to the final line of the result um, that a copy of this resolution be sent to all members of the Kansas legislature as one, I'll make an official motion at the end. And then two, um, I guess point of inquiry, but for the federal delegation, can we say federal delegation or should we list like Ron Estes? Uh, you can just say our federal delegation. Awesome, okay. I move to amend the final, be it finally resolved to include uh, all members of the Kansas State Legislature, as well as a second line to say um, the Wichita State University Federal Delegation. Is there a second? Okay. Would you like to speak on this motion? I guess just briefly. Um, the whole point of this is for these individuals to see this, uh, see this resolution. Um, personally, I don't really care that it expires in eight days. Um, it exists and it is something that can be read and can be viewed um, and the sentiment behind it doesn't expire. So I hope these people read it, whether they do, I don't know, but yeah. Senator Lamb. Uh, we talked about this portion earlier. Um, uh, are we adding the uh, public colleges in the state of Kansas? Was that already added or can we add that? 
uh, that would need to, need to be added as well. And I, the one thing I would rem or put it into perspective, I am not certain that community colleges or technical colleges have student governments. Um, so I don't know who at those institutions we would send this to um, because I'm not, I'm fairly certain many of them do not have, if at all, any student governments or student groups like you all there. Um, so just for perspective, there wouldn't be a group of students at those schools to do something similar or to pick something up from my understanding of, um, of our state student government system. And they're only at the, at the four year public schools. So just perspective out there. Senator Lamb. I do think it's still worth sending to them um, being that they are publicly funded. Um, so uh, what do you think about either the president or boards of the universities or if they have one a um, publicly public relations manager um, in, in full disclosure I don't know who those people are so this will take a lot of time to pull and to find um, so just um, thought there too. Um, yes, I'm sure those people exist, duh, but I don't know who they are, so it would take us a lot of time to find all of those names to do it. Um, just food for thought. Chairperson Thompson. I guess some other point of inquiry, but is there not someone with the Board of Regents who can disseminate the information as well? Not that, that we would ask them to you know, do our bidding or whatever, but there should be someone who has those contexts, right? I would assume so, but they would have to give it to us to use it, because they would not send it on your behalf. For, that probably is something I could for sure say. Not because it's this, because they wouldn't do that for anything that we do. Senator Lamb. So probably just the presidents of those uh, uh, two years then. Chairperson Thompson. Can I accept an amendment to my amendment as friendly or does that have to be? Okay, that's a friendly amendment. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this amendment? Seeing none, we're gonna move into the voting period on the amendment. The voting window is open. With 18 yes, zero no, and one abstention, the amendment passes. So now we're going to move back into the debate period on the overall legislation. Is there anyone else who would like to speak and debate on the legislation as a whole? Seeing none. We're going to move into the voting period. The voting window is open. With 14 yes, 0 no, and 5 abstentions, the motion passes. Moving into section seven, adjournment. I adjourn this meeting at 9.23 p.m. Please make sure you do that voting thing, the Senator of the Year thing. Please do that and leave it or pull it, bring it over here when you are done or take it up to Kylie. Again, please make sure you vote on the Senator of the Year thing and take them up to Kylie. Thank you.